Good morning. It is good to see you all. Hey, uh, if you're a guest with us, again, a special welcome to you. So glad that you chose to come and spend some of your morning here with us. My name is Kondo. I get to serve as a pastor here. And uh, this morning, we are starting a three-week series that we are calling Summer Walk. And uh, our hope is that this series um, is going to introduce us to some really basic steps, and that these basic steps will turn it into ways that we walk, not just in the summer, but that will continue to apply apply these steps even in the winters of our lives, which is why boots are good to even purchase now, to start to think about um, all that's ahead. And if you've been around, then you know we just came out of a series in which we're talking about freedom. We're talking about the freedom that Jesus Christ has given us um, as his followers, um, that Jesus Christ has unshackled us and has removed every obstacle that has kept us from living fully the way God designed and desired us to live. And as we continue to explore um, that conversation in Galatians chapter 5, one of the things Paul said to us very clearly is, listen, if you have any hope of living fully in everything that you've been called and created to live in, you are going to have to learn what it means to walk by the Spirit, when we get to verse 16 of Galatians chapter 5, Paul makes this profound announcement. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. If you want to know what it means to walk by the Spirit, that is impossible apart from, if you want to walk in freedom, it's impossible apart from learning to walk by the Spirit. Because if you try and live in and enjoy your freedom and your fullness by striving and working really hard, you're going to find yourself exhausted and you're going to find yourself a slave to the really tyrannical master called legalism. God's to please God. I messed up again and now guilt makes me feel like I can't talk to God and so I've got to start earning my way back to God and that introduces a different slavery that robs you of your freedom. If on the other hand you say, well, I'm going to try and enjoy my freedom by just shrugging every law of God and just doing me, doing what I want, you are going to find yourself enslaved to to the very pleasures you've used your freedom to run after. And you find yourself unable to say no to your passions, unable to say no to your desire for pleasure, and you'll be a slave all over again, stuck in cycles and patterns of addiction. Legalism doesn't work. That will not help you to walk in freedom. License, that doesn't work. That won't help you to walk in freedom. He says the only way to learn to walk in freedom is to learn to walk by the Spirit. And he ends that chapter by saying, so therefore we keep in step with the Spirit, which raises the great question, what does it mean and what does it look like to practically walk by the Spirit, which is what we want to talk about over the course of the next three weeks. And I can almost guarantee you that this series will be borderline underwhelming for all of us. When I think about walking by the Spirit, I tend to think about these again, and we talked about this in the last series, these cataclysmic experiences that happen every once in a while. But what we'll learn is, no, 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 no. Walking by the Spirit is not so much about those rare cataclysmic major choices I make in those rare major moments of life. It is about the decisions I make every day. It's about the small decisions I make on a regular basis because decisions turn into steps and steps turn into walk. And before I know it, I am walking in the Spirit. And so this morning, we want to start by talking about a very foundational, fundamental step if we are going to be walking by the Spirit. And this step is called read your Bible. <laughs> I know. So what did you guys talk about at church? Reading our Bible? Oh, really? Very creative. Um, 
It's not monumental. Uh, it's something that if you've grown up in the church, you've been taught since you were a kid to read your Bible. Now, I know we get older and we get super profound and most sophisticated and we move away from the elementary things like reading your Bible and praying. And then eventually you start to try and journey apart from those things and you find, no, it's actually in some of those basic foundational things that we find ourselves walking by the Spirit. And so we want to just talk about reading the Bible. Um, that's it. If you're taking notes, just write real big. Read the Bible. That is the deep content of our time um, together. Read the Bible. Um, if you have a copy of the Bible, uh, you can go ahead and uh, turn. We're going to be um, reading a number of different passages of Scripture, but the one we're going to start with is in uh, the book of John. Um, and John was Jesus's closest friend, and uh, he records some of Jesus' words, um, and we're going to find some of them key, particularly towards the end of Jesus' life. We're going to be in John chapter 16. Uh, that's where we're going to start. If you don't um, have a copy of the Bible, we're going to have the verses up here on the screen. But let me say with um, deeper intensity, if you don't own a physical copy of the Bible, we would love to get one into your hands. And so at the end of the service, if you want to head to the connection corner and just ask one of the folks there um, for a copy, I know they'll be thrilled to hand one to you. But John um, chapter 16 is where we are going to, to start. Um, this is what Jesus says as he is um, heading towards the cross, and as he's heading um, back to heaven, he says to his followers, verse 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. This is Jesus, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Walking by the Spirit starts with taking steps in this book called the Bible. Show me how well you engage the Bible on a regular basis, and I'll show you how well you are walking by the Spirit, which will show you how well you are walking and enjoying the freedom and the fullness of everything you've been called to. How are you doing engaging this book called the Bible? I, I love the summer. Oh, my goodness, I love the summer. Oh. For so many reasons, I feel like John Travolta, which is a, a, a Greece reference. But summertime is just some of my favorite time ever for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons I love the summer is because of what it does for my marriage. Uh, my wife and I just a few days ago celebrated our 19th wedding anniversary. And I'm telling you that almost two decades later, I still find this woman incredibly mystifying. There's so many mysteries about this woman I cannot decode. And if husbands have never said amen, that was your spot. But then, uh, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, um, oh my goodness, there are things I just can't figure out. I wish I could figure it all out, but I, I, I just can't figure it out. Like there are times when I'm looking at her and I'm like, uh, um, 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 okay, are those the safe tears? Or are those the other ones? <laughs> Kids, go and find out. Go and find out. Let me know. Because um, I don't know. I just don't know. Mystifying. I'm mystified by, hey, how come you don't seem super romanced by this half-hour conversation about all of the NBA off-season traits? I don't understand it. That is a mystery to me. But I love summer because summer, um, it removes at least one element of mystery about my wife. I know that woman is going to be 
outside. She's going to be outside. She is going to be outside hanging out with her plants and waging war on those weeds. I know that much. I know it. She is going to be doing what she enjoys, which is hanging out in one of her gardens, which is really, really helpful for me because that's one less thing I have to guess. And so I just know when I get home, kids, do you know where you're? Never mind. She's outside. And here's why that's great, because I know that, man, if I want to bond with and I want to connect with my wife, I know where to find her. And so I'm telling you, me and Melissa and some Russian sage is an ingredients for an incredible day. I know where to find her. Mystery removed. In John chapter 16, um, Jesus is doing something similar for us. He's saying, hey, can I just decode a little of the mystery around the Holy Spirit? Because you all are going to make it super complicated. There's so many questions about the Holy Spirit. What does he look like and how does he move and and what does he do and and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Jesus says, can I just remove a lot of mystery and answer one simple question for you? You are going to find the Holy Spirit hanging out in the Bible. You don't have to worry about trying to find, where is the Holy Spirit? He says, one place I can tell you for sure, you're going to find the spirit of truth, is where truth lives. And I love Jesus later on says something to the effect of sanctify them by your truth. And he says, your word, talking to his father, your word is truth. If you want to hang out with a spirit, if you want to bond with a spirit, if you want to connect with the Holy Spirit, one of the greatest places to hang out is in his Russian sages called the Scriptures, the Word of God. And so I say again to you, tell me how well you engage this book and how you hang out in this book, and I'll tell you how you are connecting with and walking by the Spirit of God. It starts by reading this book. And um, every couple of years or so, we'll just come back to this. And we'll just come back to having a conversation about this book. And that is today. Um, This, by the way, is an incredible book. Can we just talk about that for a second? This is, number one, the most unique book on the face of the planet. The most unique book. It is, hands down, the most impressed. Look at it. The most impressive piece of literature ever composed in the history of the universe. And I want to say this, by the way, to those of you who are in high school, uh, those of you who may be going off to college, I just love to say this again. Whatever other documents, whatever other books, whatever other things you encounter, if you believe the Bible, you are believing in the single most unique book ever composed on the face of the, the planet. This book is one, one book, as you can clearly see. I feel like I'm doing a magic show. See, look, no sleight of hand. Um, it's, it's one book that's comprised of 66 separate books within it. And those 66 books were composed by about 40 different authors. And the one book comprised of 66 books composed by 40 different authors um, was written over the span of 1,600 years, conservatively speaking. One book, 66 books contained within it, 40 different authors over about 1,600 years. And this book centers around the same group of people and ultimately tells the same story about the same God. It is a 
comprehensive document that together tells one story. And I'm just telling you right now, that in and of itself is impressive. Um, the, the last time we talked about this, I did a little exercise, and uh, I shared the results with you. I, I went to my, fam my then family of three, um, apart from me, three others at the time, and I said, hey, can you guys do an exercise? I'm curious to see, like, how impressive is this really? Um, so, hey, I, I had my family sit down on the same couch, and all of them took out a piece of paper, and I said, hey, can we try and compose a bestseller? Um, each of us will write a different separate story, and we'll see if we can compose them to make one bestseller so we can all retire early. And so my family all separately wrote together some thoughts and some ideas. And let me put this up on the screen so you can see uh, this work of art. It was just glorious. Hi, Ray Lewis. Hi, Jacoby Jones. What? This is crazy. She felt this was a beautiful answer and changed everything. Hmm? Then the famous reader vanished, whoever that was. Then the audience clapped. Then the audience got books and read for the rest of the night. <laughs> Tell me that doesn't sound like drunken poetry. <laughs> be honest, I won't, I won't be offended. Needless to say, we are going to all be employed for a very long time. Retirement is not coming early. Oh, man, that is funny, funny stuff. And they live in the same house. And they were sitting on the same couch. I'm just asking you, can you imagine 40 different people over 16 different centuries composing one comprehensive document that all comes back into the stream of the same story and points to the same person, most of whom had never met because they lived in different centuries and they lived in different countries. I'm just saying this is an impressive document. Collaborative, comprehensive, with no contradictions. A group of people who didn't even know each other. And so now if you pick this book up and you start to read it, it doesn't matter where you start. You're going to end up in the same stream telling the same redemptive story about the same great God. And on top of that, it's history's best-selling book ever. Um, but that's just the book. Once you open it and you start to read through it, it just leaps into a stratosphere all unto its own because some of the 40 authors who contributed to these um, 66 books, um, <laughs> when they were writing, they dared to make predictions about future events. Which again, if you wanted to make up a book, that's probably not a good idea. But they made predictions about future events that are referred to as prophecy. Um, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, this man, for example, whose name is um, Micah, who lived some 800 years before the person of Jesus Christ showed up on the scene, he, he made some predictions um, about the person of Jesus. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, this is what it says. It says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. This is a prediction. One will come out of you, Bethlehem. Someone who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. I mean, this is so fascinating. I mean, first question for me is, wait, how will someone in the future come to rule who is from ancient times. That doesn't make sense. That's kind of ridiculous. But apart from all of that, do you know the chances that this individual, Micah, is going to accurately guess the right city in which, or the right town in which this ruler, this Messiah, would be born? I'll tell you. The odds of him guessing that is about 1 in 280,000. I'd take this guy to Vegas if I wasn't a pastor and, and, you know, stuff like that. But he, that's insane. And that is assuming he already knew somehow that there was even a Messiah to guess about. 
And if you're going to make it up, why would you pick Bethlehem, buddy? If you're going to guess, guess a bigger city. Go for, for, for Jerusalem. Go for, for one of those cities. But why even go with that nation? Go for one of the bigger nations. But he chooses Bethlehem, and the odds are crazy. Um, and that's just one prediction. If you took only eight more predictions about the person of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ came and proved right, that Jesus Christ came and fulfilled. If you just take eight more, the odds of getting nine of these predictions right about the future to be fulfilled in one person is one in ten octillion. I didn't know that number. I asked for the help from the first service, and they told me what it was. That's ten with 27 zeros. That's the odds of getting that many predictions about the future right. And Jesus, by the way, he showed up and he fulfilled over 300 predictions that were made by people who hadn't met long before Jesus was even born and stepped onto the scene. And I'm just telling you that to brag on this book. I'm just telling you that to tell you that this book is matchless. This book is unrivaled. This book is unique. It's unlike anything else ever composed by anybody. I'm just telling you that to say, read your Bible. I'm just telling you that to say, it doesn't even matter if you have an interest in walking by the Spirit. It doesn't even matter if you believe in the person of Jesus Christ. I would say, read the Bible simply because it is the most impressive piece of literature. Why wouldn't you want to pick up a book that can predict the future? Why wouldn't you want to pick up a book that is, in fact, the best-selling book in all of history? Read it just because you have a curious bone in your body. And I say this to our kids who are going to go off to college, and you're going to hear different challenges, the different claims, and I just want to say in advance, this is the most impressive document ever composed in all of history. But it's more than just the most unique piece of literature. This uh, is a, a supernatural document. And in fact, I suspect that if you picked it up and you're a cynic, you're a skeptic, you didn't believe anything about God, but hey, I heard about this bestseller and I wanted to read it, and you started to read it, my suspicion is that before long you would start to suspect, mm, this may be a supernatural document. That's just my guess. Which is exactly what it claims to be. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this. It says, all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All Scripture, this whole book, is not just unique. Apparently, this book is God-breathed. No other book makes this claim. Apparently, God was the ghost author of this book. He was the one feeding those 40 different authors what to write, what to say. He was the one who was inspiring them with what it was he wanted them to write. That's what that means, which sounds like an outrageous statement to make. And yet this outrageous statement, honestly, for me, is the statement that makes the most sense in all of the world. Forty different authors spanning 1,600 years predicting the future and all talking about the same person and all talking about the same redemptive plan. How else do you explain that without a pretty supernatural editor-in-chief, which starts to raise questions in me, like, well, that's a good point. I mean, what kind of editor-in-chief would one have to be to oversee the 1,600-year project? It's a really old dude. 1,600 
years. How else do you explain? What kind of person lives that long? What kind of editor uh, would be able to coordinate the content of composers who lived over different centuries? How would he be able to coordinate people who had never FaceTimed or spent any FaceTime together because they lived in different countries? I don't know. Sounds to me like it would have to be the kind of editor, the kind of person who spans time. It seems like it would have to be the kind of editor, the kind of person who lives in and among the different nations. It sounds like it would have to be the kind of editor who sits above space and history. It sounds like the kind of person who somehow can predict the future from the past because he is in both of those places. It makes sense to me when I read that the Bible is God-breathed because I don't know anyone in nature who can pull off something so impressive. And so when somebody says, oh, this is authored by somebody who is supernatural, I say that kind of makes sense to me. The Bible is God-breathed because only some kind of God could pull something like this off. And I'm the kind of person, by the way, if somebody came and said, we found 10 mistakes in the Bible, I'd be like, I'm still going to follow that God because um, the octillion things he got right, he's still the rightest person I've ever met. This is not just an impressive book, it is a supernatural book. And, and I would say to us, we should read the Bible. If nothing else, aren't you curious to read a supernatural document that can predict the future? Come on, Michael J. Fox, you have to at least be curious. And I love what 2 Timothy 3 says. It says that this book is God-breathed. Have you ever just paused and thought about this? Have you ever just gone to your home and picked up one of your copies and like the breath of God is in the pages of this book? God's breath every time I open this? I mean, if it's true that the, the Bible is God breathed, this is the breath of God every time I open the book. I am interacting with the... Aren't you curious to know what the howl and whistle of the breath of God sounds like? That's amazing that this is and contains the breath of God. Oh, by the way, the first time we encounter the breath of God, he is he's leaning over the lifeless frame of Adam in the garden. And the Bible says he pulls that lifeless frame up to his face and he, he breathes into Adam and Adam becomes a living soul. Lifeless frame, breath of God, living soul. There's another story told, by the way, in, in, in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel, one of God's prophets, sees a vision. And in the vision, there's a valley full of dead, dry bones. And he says, the next thing I was aware of, the breath of God entered that valley. And when the breath of God touched those lifeless, dry bones, they started to rise up until lifeless bones became an army ready to march into battle. Dry bones, breath of God, a living military force. It is amazing when you study and you read in the Old Testament, in the Scripture, the breath of God showing up. The psalmist says, oh, oh, one time God breathed, and all of the galaxies were flung into place. 
Doesn't it just make you pause and say, wait a minute, that's what's in the pages of this book? That when I open the book, the same breath that brought dead things to life is now opened up to me. Aren't you at least curious to open up a book that has the, the, the potential to bring dead things in your own life to life? Aren't you curious to see what this book could do for your lifeless marriage? Aren't you curious to see what this book could do for places where you've experienced nothing but defeat and there's a possibility that an army might rise up to say no to sin? Aren't you curious to see what the breath of God might do in all of this? But mostly, you know what's fascinating? The story of Adam teaches us that um, what our souls breathe, what our souls inhale is the breath of God. Our souls thrive in breathing the breath of the living God. My heart needs oxygen. But what my soul needs to thrive is the very breath of God. Aren't you curious to open up a book that gives your soul some sips of the holy air with which it was designed to thrive? Who wouldn't do that? I'll tell you who wouldn't. Nine out of ten people, because apparently only one out of ten people read this book consistently. This book contains the breath of God, which is how your soul thrives. This book contains the breath of God, which is how dead things come rushing back to life. I say, read this book just so you can breathe. And just so you can't see if the miracle of lifeless things coming to life doesn't start to be your reality as you read this book. This book is apparently also surgical, which is probably one of its scariest um, qualities. Um, not for the faint of heart. Um, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says it this way, for the Word of God is alive because it's the breath of God and it's active because wherever God's breath shows up, things happen. And it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The Bible is like a sword, sharper than a surgical scalpel. This is really interesting, by the way, because um, in our era, and we're not new to this, but we have a fascination with self-discovery. Um, hey, what's your Myers-Briggs? You know, L-M-N-O-P. What's your, you know, what's your Enneagram? 45. I'm a 45, you know. But we've all started to, to explore these different tools that help unravel the deepest parts of who we are and why we behave the way we behave and why we think the way we think it and why we interact with the world the way we interact with the world. Do you know that... This is the sharpest and best tool to unravel the deepest parts of who you are and show you who you are really. That's what it means when it says it has the ability to cut through all of the stuff you do to the very heart of your motive. Now, why did you wear that really? No, why did you get angry really? Just because I'm mad. No, the scripture has a way of getting to the heart and getting to the intentions and getting to the motives and showing you who you really, 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 really are. Which means this book has the power to say, this is who you are. Do you need to be changed? This is who you are. Are you more beautiful than you realized on account of the lies you've heard? This is who you really are. Did you realize that it's out of your emptiness that you continue to run after these things. James calls this the mirror because this is the ultimate mirror that helps us to see ourselves most clearly as God describes and defines us. This book is surgical. And I'm just saying, read the Bible if for no other reason because you're curious to discover who you really are and what's really true about you. And there's no better place, no offense to Enneagram, no offense to Myers or Briggs, but I'm saying to you 
This is the best way to get a true sense of who you are. And I suspect that this is one of the reasons that many of us don't enjoy going back to this book. Because it will tell you some things that you don't want to hear about yourself. And you'd rather go to Instagram and get somebody to say, like, 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 like. And the Bible is like, no, this is where you really need to be brought back to the person of Jesus. This is what's really wrong with your marriage. This is what's really happening in your parenting. It's surgical. And I'd say read it, if nothing else. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live with a deceived view of myself. I don't want to live, you know, looking in one of those, you know, uh, department store mirrors that make me seem, you know, hotter than I really am. I want to look in the scriptures so that I can get the most accurate aspect of me. The Bible is surgical, but most importantly, most, most, most importantly, the Bible is personal. Uh, one author put it this way. He said, the written word exists to point us to the living word. When we say that this book is personal, I am saying that this book, as unique and surgical and supernatural as it might be, is ultimately about a person. The Bible is all and ultimately about the person of Jesus Christ. From beginning to end, this book is personal. It is about Jesus. I'm going to say that one more time. From beginning to end, this book is about a person, Jesus. When you open this book, the breath of God emerges. But more than that, the face of Jesus starts to come into focus. This book is ultimately about the person of Jesus Christ. One time, um, Jesus was talking to a bunch of church people who were experts in the Bible, and he schooled them in this very truth. John chapter 5, verse 39, here's what Jesus said. He said, you study the Scriptures diligently, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, he said. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Powerful. This book is unique. Read it just because of that. This book is supernatural. It contains the breath of God that will change your life. But ultimately, God breathed this book so that his breath could propel us towards his son, the very person of Jesus Christ. This book will reveal the deepest and truest aspects of who we are. But more than that, this book will reveal the deepest and truest aspects of who the person of Jesus Christ is. It is a personal book. I love that. Um, Leviticus, Jesus is saying to these followers, these, these guys, he's saying, hey, Leviticus, it's, that's about me. Like all those ridiculous rituals and regulations that none of you could keep, that was about me. Leviticus is about me. It is about a bunch of regulations and rituals and rules that you could not keep and so that those rules and regulations would exhaust you and you get to the place where you say, God, we cannot pull it off. And then I would show up on the scene and I would announce to you, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden from failing. I will give you rest. I will meet the rules and regulations on your behalf. It's about Jesus. Oh, the story of Abraham, that's about Jesus. Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, that story was ultimately about my father who dragged me up to to a hill and sacrificed me for the sake of your 
sin. Even that was about me. Oh, Noah, that was a good one, but that was about me because I am ultimately the ark. And if you believe in me, if you believe in me, then you will escape the coming flood of God's judgment. The entire book, start to finish, is about the person of Jesus Christ. God breathes this unique book so that as we engage this book, we discover in it the face of Jesus Christ and his breath draws us to him. By the way, if you start to do a study in the Old Testament about the ruach, the breath of God, you will find it tends to be super synonymous with the Spirit of God. And one of the Holy Spirit's favorite things on the planet is to push people towards the person of Jesus Christ. It's to shine a spotlight on the person of Jesus Christ. Is it any surprise to you that he loves to hang out in the Russian sages of the Word of God? Because the Word of God is ultimately about the person who is the Son of God, who the Holy Spirit wants to do everything to help us to move towards. Because the Holy Spirit knows that as we take steps towards the person of Jesus Christ, we find life and we find fullness. As we take steps towards the person of Jesus Christ, we find ourselves taking steps away from the sin that entangled us. We find ourselves taking steps away from the bondage and the chains because we're moving towards Jesus. And the Holy Spirit says, and I will reveal his truth to you and I will show you who he is more and more as you meet me in that place. No wonder we can't walk by the Spirit of God unless we're engaging the Word of God, the truth of God, which paints a picture of the face of Jesus Christ, which is what the Holy Spirit loves to do. Let me show you more of Jesus because life is ultimately about coming to him. The Word of God is personal. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Read the Bible. Because that's where the Holy Spirit will meet you and starts to show you Jesus. And as he does, you will find yourself springing to life and you will find yourself enjoying fullness and freedom in him. Number one, you got to have a plan. You've got to have a plan. If you're going to read this book and revel in the face of Jesus and journey with the Holy Spirit, you've got to have a plan. It's a key principle, but I think it explains why so many of us don't exercise when we would like to, because we don't have a plan. Oh man, I'm going to, this year, I'm going to just be better at the Word. What's the plan? I don't have a plan, but I'm going to just, I'm just going to exercise more. What's the plan? And by plan, I mean a plan for when and a plan for what. If you don't have a plan for when you're going to read, you're going to find yourself just occasionally, you think about it and then you you read, but you'll be super inconsistent. If you don't have a plan for what, then you're going to get to the Bible super excited and be like, oh, um, Leviticus, nope. I'll try again tomorrow. (laughs) Um, Choose a time every day when you will read your Bible. Pick a time. You know your schedule. Better yet, reorient your schedule. Pick a time and then set an alarm. One of the greatest annoyances in my life is when my phone starts to tell me, you haven't read the Bible in three days. You don't know me. You know, just leave me alone, you know. But there are ways now that we can put these alarms in, in place. And I would encourage you, pick a time and then set something that reminds you so that you don't forget. DVR that time on some device. 
Um, and then choose a book of the Bible to work through or choose a devotional study to work through. I love the era in which we live. Nana, nani, boo, boo, Paul. If Paul lived in this era, he would have like 16,000 apps, I think, and he would just capitalize. We have so many resources where people have done so much hard work to come up with plans so that we don't have to start to create. We just need to show up and pick out of hundreds of plans. That's what I love about version on your phone. You can download this Bible app, and inside that app, there are so many different plans that you can choose from so that you don't just pick the when, but you get to choose the what and get started. I would say pick a plan. And while you're picking things, pick a partner. Um, Pick a partner. Uh, Walking with the Spirit is a community process. We need each other. Um, Man, the other week I made the mistake of sharing with some people some of my, like, health goals. And um, then all of a sudden they thought it was their right to start dogging me up at him. Well, have you done it yet? Have you done it today? Have you done it yet? Have you done it yet? Like, mute this conversation, you know. Um, <laughs> and then I did it. Because, and I remember thinking there's no way I would have followed through. I would have made a whole bunch of excuses if I hadn't looped other people in to help me to execute the plan. Pick a partner. Pick somebody and say, hey, I'm starting this plan. I want to invite you. Would you do this with me? That way we can remind each other. That way we can encourage each other. That way we can be just, you know, partners as we journey in this regard. Um, I know John Barrett and some of the men meet to do Bible studies in the morning. That's a great place if you're looking for a place um, to go and start working with other people. So there's a partnership in that. I know the, the, the ladies are starting a Priscilla Shire um, Bible study coming up here in a little bit on the armor of God. That's a great place to band with other people and get into the Word. Something about partnership is so key. So I would ask you, pick a plan and then pick another person. At least one person. And maybe you're going to be helping that person by saying, hey, I'm starting this study. Would you join me? Our staff does this together. You know, Jen Neer, our children's ministry director, picked a plan for us. And so we've started this plan together. And every time I show up, I'm like, okay, I've got to be ready for this plan. It's just another layer of reason to get into the Word of God. And then let me say something really quickly about portion. Pick a portion. I I remember, you know, thinking like, oh my goodness, reading the Bible is really about volume. That the more spiritual you are, you know, depends on the volume of Bible you consume. And then I remember my mom saying stuff to me like, Kondo, only eat as much as your body can process and use, you know. And that's what she used to tell me, like, come on. Like, how much are you trying to eat? Your body doesn't know what to do with all of that. And I think sometimes we think like to Bible binge is a spiritual thing. But you know what happens if you Bible binge and you eat more than you can actually apply? Because the Bible says, don't be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. If you eat more than you can consume, Paul says, knowledge will puff you up. And you find your spiritual pants a little tight and you won't understand why. (laughs) Because now you know a lot, but you're not using it. You know a lot, but you're not necessarily applying it into the exercise. So I would encourage you, portions. It's actually healthier to take smaller portions that you can marinate on, that you can ruminate on, that you can meditate on, and that you can apply. Man, some of the studies that I do on my my app are like five minutes, and I find myself feeling guilty. Like, surely I've got to read more. Surely I love Jesus more than five minutes worth. But listen, it takes you five minutes to eat the meal. And then it takes you five hours to to process the meal as you go and as you ask for his help in applying it. So think about portions so you do not start to think consuming a whole bunch. And some of you, that's it. Like, oh man, I, I don't have two hours to get into the Word. Two hours? Like, are you, what, are you a seminary student? In which case, yes, good, two hours, that's awesome. <laughs> um, last thing, and this is really important, John Hoover, wherever you are, emerge, please, um, is, let me say something about prayer. Um, 
Because this is more than just a unique document. This is a, a supernatural document that contains the breath of God. And this is more than just a document that reveals us to us. It's a document that reveals Jesus to us. I cannot say enough how powerful it will be for your pattern once you pick a plan and once you invite somebody to be a part of that. I can't say enough how key it is when you start reading this book to say a simple prayer, Spirit of God, meet me here and show me the face of Jesus in these pages. If this book is about Jesus, I don't get the majority of the ways this book is about Jesus. And I don't get what things you want to reveal to me. But Spirit of the living God, would you please open my eyes to see things my mind cannot see in and of itself. Would you please show me the things you want me to see about Jesus so that I can move towards him a little bit more. So that the information becomes revelation of the face of Jesus. Not just I know more, but now I know him more because the Spirit of God is making him known to me. Read this book, and you find yourself meeting the Spirit there. And the minute you say, Spirit, would you walk me to Jesus? He will say, oh man, this is my favorite thing to do. And here we go. And I can't imagine six months from now what this church will look like, what your family will look like, what your life will look like, what our world will look like. Because a number of us said, I am going to make a decision and start a plan to get into the Word of God, to get back into the Word of God, or just to continue in the Word of God, asking the Spirit to do His work. Amen? So Spirit, do your work. And I pray that this will be more than just a message. I pray that there will actually be people sitting in this room who maybe haven't read their Bible or haven't read it consistently, and that all changes now. I beg you, please don't let us just listen and be entertained and move out. May our lives be different because we not just heard what your word says, but we applied it. And as we do that, we'll find ourselves walking with you and walking away from the things that shackle us and keep us from freedom. In your name we pray. Amen.